Tonight, the growing calls for a humanitarian pause as the death toll climbs and the desperation deepens in Gaza. <laughs> Hospitals on the brink of collapse. We've just run out of almost everything. The fears for civilians and hostages trapped. Our hearts are breaking for the parents. Holding the interest rate, but a new warning about the cost of living. Today's forecast has inflation on a higher path than we expected. As food banks grapple with record demand. The supermarket got really expensive. Plus, getting in the game. First game of the year is like first day of school. The roar of a new NBA season with a record number of Canadian players. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. We begin with breaking news tonight and another horrific reminder of America's epidemic of gun violence. At least 22 people are dead in multiple locations, including a bar and a bowling alley in Lewiston, Maine. That's roughly the same number of murders in that state every year. Police have released these photos of the suspect and also this image of a vehicle they believe is connected to the rampage. And they're asking everyone to shelter in place as they investigate. As many as 60 people are believed to have been wounded. U.S. President Joe Biden spoke to Maine's governor and offered federal assistance, but he spent most of the day focused on the crisis in the Middle East, pressing Israel to protect civilians in Gaza, where hospitals are teetering on the edge of total failure. A new round of Israeli airstrikes sending scores of civilians to overrun medical facilities that are running out of essential supplies. Some have shut down entirely. Rescuers today raced to save who they could. This little girl trapped in the rubble of what used to be her family's apartment, her leg pinned under concrete. And then moments later, she is finally freed. With global attention turning to the death toll in Gaza, Israel kept focus on the October 7th Hamas massacre, showing journalists horrifying new video from the day. Israeli military releasing this dash cam footage today, saying it shows Hamas using a heavy machine gun to fire at survivors fleeing to Supernova Music Festival. CTV's Heather Wright is in Tel Aviv with the spiraling humanitarian catastrophe. In the rubble left after an Israeli airstrike, rescuers search for survivors. As they pull this father from a collapsed building, they reassure him his family is alive. So many others have been killed. The death toll in Gaza since the start of the war is now more than 6,500, according to the Hamas controlled health ministry. Our UNICEF says more than 400 children are either killed or injured in Gaza every single day. Hospitals are near the brink of collapse. The UN says 12 have been shut down, eight of them because of a lack of fuel needed to keep generators running. The hospitals will not be able to deliver life-saving services, nor keep the life support machines, nor the incubators on if they do not receive fuel that will help their uh, generators generate electricity for all these machines. Fuel has so far not been included in the aid that has started to trickle into Gaza. Israel fears it will get into the hands of Hamas, who they also accuse of hoarding vital supplies. The doctors warn without fuel, medical centers will soon become mass graves. Israel's prime minister reiterated his warning to Palestinians to move south, saying plans for a ground invasion are well underway. The timing of the military's operation, Benjamin Netanyahu said today, will be determined by consensus of the war cabinet adding troops will only go in when the conditions are ideal. Today, the Israeli Defense Force released this video reportedly showing a Hamas attack from the sea being thwarted. And while most rockets fired into Israel are intercepted by the Iron Dome, one got through tonight in Tel Aviv, injuring six. It has been two and a half weeks since the brutal massacre that started this war. Two and a half weeks since 222 people were kidnapped. And concern for those hostages, especially children, is growing. These blindfolded and bloody teddy bears 
represent that fear. It highlights every day that we're going through. Uh, hearts are breaking for the parents. Qatar continues to conduct negotiations for the release of more hostages. Its foreign minister said today he hopes for a breakthrough soon. Omar. Heather Wright in Tel Aviv. Israel's ambassador to the United Nations says his country will stop issuing visas to UN personnel after these comments yesterday by the Secretary General. It is important to also recognize the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. Israel accused the UN chief of justifying a massacre. Today, Antonio Guterres rejected that. I am shocked by the misrepresentations by some of my statement yesterday in the Security Council. Words matter when speaking about this conflict, like the difference between a ceasefire, which Canada is not calling for, instead opting to endorse a humanitarian pause. CTV's Judy Trin on the critical difference. Since the weekend, only about a few dozen trucks carrying food, water and medicine have entered Gaza. A sliver of the 500 daily truckloads of aid Palestinians needed even before the war began. We are very concerned about the humanitarian uh, situation that exists in Gaza and, and we believe and, and, and support the idea of humanitarian pause. A pause in hostilities to get more aid into Gaza is supported by Canada and the U.S., but it's a tiny band-aid. So a humanitarian pause is um, time limited. It's going to be 24 hours or 48 hours or however long the agreement is with the parties involved. 1.4 million people have fled their homes. Aid organizations say a pause isn't enough. They're calling for a ceasefire to save lives. A humanitarian ceasefire really means the end of hostilities, um, a, a time for really humanitarian aid to enter, for access to be given, for it to be safe, and to really reach all those who are affected. Israel has said repeatedly it will not accept a ceasefire, but it may accept a humanitarian pause that can be limited geographically. That could allow it to launch a ground invasion to hunt Hamas hiding in tunnels in the north while allowing aid to go through in the south. The ceasefire does imply that you may not go back to fighting and that there is a political settlement that's possible. And for Israel, neither of those options are on the table at the moment. Analysts say in general, ceasefires favor weaker parties, but a humanitarian pause is a more neutral measure, which could provide some help to victims caught in the crossfire. Omar. All right, Judy, thanks. U.S. President Joe Biden's multi-billion dollar aid package for Israel and Ukraine could soon be debated in the U.S. House of Representatives after it elected a new speaker today. <laughs> the Republican majority in the House picked Louisiana's Mike Johnson for the role, ending three weeks of chaos where three other Republican nominees for the job were rejected by their colleagues after the ouster of Mike McCarthy. We know that... Uh that there's a lot going on in our country, domestically and abroad, and we are ready to get to work again to solve those problems. The speaker is second in line to the presidency. Donald Trump congratulated the new speaker during a break at his fraud trial in New York. Today, the former president was fined again for violating a gag order, $10,000 for comments he made outside court. This judge is a very partisan judge with a person who's very partisan sitting alongside him. The judge summoned Trump to the witness stand to explain his remarks after he appeared to reference a court clerk in violation of the order. Trump insisted he did not. The judge didn't believe him, and Trump stormed out of the courtroom. Signs of an economic slowdown prevented a rate hike today. The Bank of Canada held its key interest rate at 5% today, but warned inflation hasn't dropped to the bank's target level. That sustained high cost of living is sending a record number of Canadians to food banks. CTV's Vanessa Lee on the surge. In a move widely expected by economists, the Bank of Canada is holding interest rates steady for now. Monetary policy is working to cool the economy and relieve price pressures. Inflation is slowing down, but for millions, basic necessities are unaffordable. Never have food banks across the country seen this level of need. 
A record number of hampers is being put together here for Montrealers who are barely making ends meet. They said, uh, I don't know how to pay the rent. I don't know how, uh, how I can eat because uh, every, all my salary goes to, the, to pay the rent, to pay the electricity. Nearly 2 million Canadians visited a food bank in March, which is unprecedented. That's a 32% increase compared to last year. I'm really grateful and it's... This is Goy Perez's first time here. I just moved to this city, so it's been a bit hard to find a new job. Uh, here, also the supermarket got really expensive. What's particularly troubling is a third of food bank users are children, even though they represent just 20% of the population. There has been no relief at the checkout. For more than a year, food inflation has been above 5% for the first time in decades. The heads of Canada's major grocery chains are expected back in Ottawa next week to explain their plans to stabilize prices. Experts say it's only part of the solution. We need to see um, our social safety net fixed. We need to see investments in affordable housing. We cannot continue to support this level of growth. Food banks are appealing for help to keep shelves stocked so struggling Canadians can get through this crisis, especially with the holidays around the corner. Hi. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. Police say the man who shot and killed a woman and three children in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, had been involved in intimate partner investigations in the past. The victims were killed during a shooting rampage at two separate homes before the gunman turned the weapon on himself. Critics are calling on the government to do more to protect future victims. We can save these lives, uh, but we do need to approach it with the um, seriousness that it deserves, and that means declaring it an epidemic. The Ontario government recently rejected the recommendation of a coroner's inquest to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic on the basis that it is not an infectious or communicable disease. A Quebec mother says she always felt more could have been done to save her daughters three years ago, and she wants an apology from police. Her comments follow the findings of a coroner's report into their deaths by their father. Here's CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin. Since that day in July 2020, when six-year-old Remy and 11-year-old Nora disappeared, their mother has believed police could have done more to save their lives. Now that conclusion is in black and white in a coroner's report. I've always felt that my daughters could still be alive today, says Amélie Lemieux. Coroner Luc Malouin set out to untangle the mystery that began on a hot summer night in 2020. Martin Carpentier, who was about to divorce from his wife, had taken his two daughters out on a drive. Police found his car a still frozen ice cream cone inside. It had crashed on a highway. All passengers were missing. The girls were found dead three days later, killed by their father the day after they disappeared. He'd also taken his own life. The coroner determined investigators, partly acting on information that Carpentier was a good dad, mobilized too few resources and organized the search and rescue too slowly. Malouin says his recommendations include that police should always assume the worst case in the disappearance of a child under the age of 13. The Quebec police force is facing a lawsuit and won't comment on the specifics of the report. But Chief Inspector Patrick Marchand says each missing persons case brings new information that helps search teams do better. The girl's mother now hopes police will implement the coroner's recommendations. Nora and Remy deserve an apology, says their mother. For now, I'm the one apologizing to them every single night on behalf of the police force. Police investigate thousands of cases of disappearances a year. But experts say this is a good reminder that acting too slowly or making the wrong assumptions can cost lives, including cases of children abducted by their own parents. Omar. Genevieve, thank you. Former fashion mogul Peter Nygaard testified for the first time at his sexual assault trial. The 82-year-old denied building private suites inside his business properties in Toronto, California and the Bahamas. And he insisted his Toronto office had several exits. Nygaard has pleaded not guilty to five counts of sexual assault and one count of forcible confinement. 
Coming up, running out of water. We filled our bathtub this morning, first thing, knowing that the water was going to be cut off. The state of emergency in an Alberta town after a pipeline break. Plus, remembering Richard Roundtree, a tribute to Hollywood's first black action hero. A trail of destruction tonight in the popular resort city of Acapulco after Hurricane Otis slammed into Mexico's Pacific coast. Otis came aground overnight as a Category 5 hurricane tearing through buildings, ravaging roads, and leaving large areas without power or cell service. Otis has since weakened to a subtropical storm. A community west of Calgary is under a state of emergency tonight after it nearly ran out of water. A weekend accident pierced a hole in a main water line in Cochrane, draining the town's reservoirs. Here's CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier. In the foothills of the Canadian Rockies, this town's supply of clean water is running low. And for some Cochrane residents, there's no water at all. Service has been shut off to 16 homes. Life goes on as it does for most of us. So uh, realistically, we're just going to you know, do what we can. We stocked up on some bottled water. It's still inconvenient, but it could be way worse off, really. Over the weekend, contractors accidentally severed a main water line and a sewer line, spilling sewage into the Bow River and nearly draining the town's drinking water supply. A temporary fix is now in place for sewage, and officials say the quality of drinking water was never impacted. Now, the priority is isolating and shutting down the main line around the leak so repairs can be made. We know where the break is, we know what the issue is, and we know how to fix it. Town officials say residents have helped by cutting their water usage. Some businesses have voluntarily closed, and water is being trucked in to keep the supply from going dry. The situation now less dire than earlier this week. Our reservoir levels are at a more and much more stable place. We're trending positively, but we're certainly not out of the woods yet. A state of local emergency remains in place. Residents being told to only use water for essential needs. This includes washing your hands, brushing your teeth and cooking. We also recognize the need to wash. Although we are making progress in replenishing our water reservoirs, uh, it is still important to continue to conserve water where you can. Work on repairing the line is expected to start in the coming days. Once the leak is fixed, it will still take several more days to fill the town's reservoirs before Cochrane's 30,000 residents can get back to normal. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Edmonton. Still ahead. Hoop dreams and determination as the Toronto Raptors start a new season. Canada's only NBA team tipped off a brand new season in Toronto tonight. This year marks the third straight season that opening night rosters feature at least 120 international players. And as CTV's Heather Butts reports, Canada is leading the way. Hitting home court, it's a new season for the Toronto Raptors with a new coach and fresh faces on the floor. There's a point where, you know, I just get in my head and think, you know, this is basketball at the end of the day, what I've been doing since I was a little kid. The National Basketball Association has a record 125 international players on opening night rosters this season. A record 26 players are from Canada, the most of any country outside the U.S. Two of them, Nikhil Alexander-Walker and Leonard Miller, playing in their home country tonight for the Minnesota Timberwolves. It's incredible, especially when you look at where things were not long ago when there was a couple Canadians, two, three, four Canadians floating around the league. Now, according to the NBA, there's 26. It's actually 27 if you include Chris Boucher, who was born in St. Lucia but grew up in Montreal and considers himself to be a Canadian. A representation of how the sport has grown. The three. Canada is proving to be a powerhouse for producing strong talent, winning bronze at the World Cup our first time on a podium in 87 years. I think for sure we have the world's attention now. He throws it ahead to Barrett. Barrett. His son, R.J. Barrett, is among the top Canadians in the league, athletes who are now inspiring the next generation. You know, having players go out there and perform and then having the kids in our country 
seeing that and saying, you know, that I want to do that. You know, I, I believe I can do that. He did it. Canada's men's basketball team has qualified for the Summer Olympics. With so much talent, analysts say picking the final roster will be a tough call. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto. And in case you're wondering, the Raptors got the win tonight. After the break. Shaft's his name. Shaft's his game. Remembering trailblazing movie star Richard Roundtree. The entertainment world is paying tribute tonight to the actor who helped change the way African-American actors were portrayed on the big screen. Richard Roundtree, dubbed the first black action hero for his pivotal role as Shaft, has died. Here's CTV's Melanie Nagy on his trailblazing feats. Suave and smooth. Right on. But also tough and tenacious. That was Shaft. The iconic character played by groundbreaking actor Richard Roundtree. The mob wanted Harlem back. They got Shaft. New York-born Roundtree was 29 when he landed the role of Detective John Shaft. The 1970s movie was not only an instant hit, but changed the course of his life. In tribute to him, let me just stick these on. Michael Williams, producer and former Much Music VJ, has long tracked Roundtree's career. When Shaft came along, it was a complete game changer uh, in terms of culture, in terms of art. Shaft was among the first black exploitation films, which were movies centered on bold, courageous black characters. Roundtree is credited for redefining how African American men were seen on screen, <laughs> proving they could play powerful action heroes. It was one of those movies that just changed life for everybody that was black. The actor also appeared in other films and in several TV series, including Roots. Damn right. But it was his take on the hard-hitting detective that kept him busy. There were several Shaft sequels. And a remake that included Samuel L. Jackson. At the time, Roundtree called the film a tribute. It is an homage to all of the Shaft films. Today on social media, Jackson praised him as the best to ever do it and said Shaft will always be his creation. Along with his success, Roundtree raised five children. He died from pancreatic cancer this week at age 81. The iconic role he had was Shaft. That will never, ever be forgotten. A trailblazing actor with a long lasting legacy. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. Incredible life and career. That's a snapshot of this Wednesday for all of us at CTV National News. Good night.